Scuba diving. It's amazing to try, but is it just an aspiration, a fun idea, maybe beyond the reach of ordinary people? You can do it on a student budget, but what does it take to learn? I set out to find out, and my quest starts here at the local swimming pool. You can dive pretty much all over the world. Near any coast there will be wrecks, sea life and an entirely new perspective to experience compared to life above the water. My aim was to get the BSAC qualification and spend a week diving somewhere warm and interesting. Just off the coast of Morocco, owned by Spain and a hub for British sun lovers, Lanzarote and the Canary Islands stood out as the best option. Stunningly clear tropical waters, a plethora of diving schools and an abundance of sea life and shipwrecks to explore, low cost flights and out of season accommodation made this a destination easy to visit on a small budget. Lanzarote is a good place to dive, you get a lot of fish life here, a lot of different types, a lot of colours, um, the nature of where the island is on the planet, you get a lot of things that pass through, so you get a lot of things that you may not expect and they may be there for a week and then gone and you might not see them again for a while, but there's always a good chance you never really know what you're going to see on a dive. So back at the pool, I needed to pick up some basic skills, safety information and understand the theory required to mitigate the risks of diving. The local club had all the gear and volunteer instructors who took me through assembling the buoyancy vest, cylinder, regulator and the safety requirements. Do you need to be fit, you might ask? Well, it helps. One needs to be healthy, but not heroically buff. Although it can't hurt to look good in a wetsuit. Everyone dives with a buddy. You check your partner's equipment and look out for each other. Hand signals are important underwater, as speaking is obviously quite tricky. The deeper you dive, the greater the weight of water on your body. This is first noticeable in the ears, where you have to pinch your nose and blow to ensure that the pressure equalises. You learn to clear your mask should it get flooded, how to share air if yours runs out and importantly how to manage a controlled lift to the surface just in case something goes wrong. Some people find the process quite hard, so practicing in a 3 metre pool is essential. Yeah, the steps involved in teaching someone to dive is uh, to teach them how to put the equipment together and take it apart and be able to maintain it. Uh, the rules to dive in on uh, looking after their, their air consumption, how long they're allowed to spend underwater, the effects it can have on the body and also then the general skills underwater that they may need. And then to the open waters of Lanzarote. Again, I needed to prove my competence with the scuba equipment to the instructor. But once I had repeated the safety exercises and successive dives to 20 meters, I was qualified. Now I'm free to join diving groups pretty much anywhere in the world, and that's how I spent the next five days. A lot of things happen on the land, we're used to being there, where underwater it's, it is a whole new world and it's, there's still a lot to actually be um, discovered and be found and, and be seen. Shipwrecks in marine life are astounding to see. It's slightly weird and eerie swimming alongside all this wreckage, wondering what happened to the people in the ships. But they've become refuges for aquatic life, adding a sharp contrast to the dramatic awe of a rusting relic. It's an amazing freedom, being in the water. Sure, you've got all the gear on, but you're weightless and it's silent. You truly feel like a part of the underwater ecosystem. 
A single cylinder gives you about enough air for an hour, with a third of the tank left as a safety margin. Seeing the world from a different perspective has a profound influence on my well-being. It's calm, and yet I'm doing something that really gets my adrenaline flowing. Yes, there are risks, but you can mitigate them. Mostly, it's about appreciating a different aspect of our incredible world, which in some places is rapidly disappearing. And what else can one do when you're not underwater? Well, there's the eating and sleeping, of course, and there is a nightlife, of sorts, but it's not exceptional. The beer is cheaper than the UK, and the cannabis cafes are not exactly hidden from view either. But if you're committed to getting the best from your diving, early nights and a certain amount of restraint are probably for the best. It's under two hours from the south to the north of Lanzarote, whether you hire a car or go by bus, I spent the last day in the very north at La Graciosa Island. A high-speed ferry takes you to a place with no roads, one town and a desert of sand in the middle. With a hire bike, I reached the extraordinary beaches at the top of the island. Most days there's no one there and traditionally you suntan and swim naked. On my visit, the wind was high, the waves exciting and the place was crowded. It's hard to underestimate the impact of one man to the island of Lanzarote. Wherever you go, there is evidence of the island's most loved and extraordinary son, the visionary 20th century artist, sculptor and architect César Manrique. The dominance of his influence on his native island is undeniable. The low-rise white buildings everywhere, the controlled development of tourist attractions, inspiring installation art on roundabouts, and an amazing sunken cactus gardens are just a few examples of his achievements. As well, of course, as an incredible catalogue of artworks inspired by his childhood and later life on the island. You could argue Manrique is positively a shaped Lanzarote today, just as much as the massive volcanic eruptions scarred the place in the mid-18th century. That cataclysm left over a quarter of the island's surface convulsed, contorted, and enveloped in magma. The bleak and desolate landscape of the Timanfaya National Park is a stark contrast to the beauty of the sea and the coastal areas. The black lava eruptions are as sharp on the hand as the eye and feel like an alien planet. But it's a short ride out of town and definitely worth the 45 minute bus tour to check it out. Another option is to explore by camel but I wanted to get back to diving. I enjoy uh, showing people what is actually underwater and a different experience because the environment itself is so much different to on the land. And of course fish are not used to having humans down there so they pay, pay very little interest in us at times. They don't run off in a different direction where you'll get that with birds and animals. They'll tend to stay away from humans whereas underwater they're, they're non too plus, non too fussed about it. And so they stick around and you can get really close to actually what's going on.
the risks are there, but it is a very safe sport and that's what we learn for. Uh, a lot of the skills are just general day-to-day -day things. The water may get into the mask and therefore makes it difficult to see anything going on down there. Or the regulator may get uh, water in or your mouth may get water in every now and again. And it's just being able to clear it so that you can stay underwater for as long as possible. Enjoy the most out of the dive. One could dive two or three times a day if you wish. The dive school organises groups and trips and you just sign up. For a couple of dives, we took a boat out rather than going in from the shore. Jumping off the boat, you have to hold on to everything. Regulator, pressure gauge and camera in one hand, and you use the other to keep your mask on. Otherwise, loose bits might fly up and hit you in the face. To get more young people in, uh, probably get them more interested in the environment and what's going on around them. But to actually see human activity under there is, um, I think, more noticeable than seeing human activity on the land, and especially what kind of things we leave behind, etc. It's, it's not a cheap hobby, uh, for lots of reasons, mostly because of course it, it can't be because of the amount of equipment and the type of equipment. Uh, it needs to be of a, a certain standard, therefore it comes with a certain cost. always been a man's type of sport because a lot of diving actually comes from being in military and doing military service and it's just always been seen as a more manly thing to do yet there's a lot more women there in the sport uh, and I know personally a lot of women instructors so which can only be a good thing. Diving twice a day every day builds your skills and comfort levels with the equipment and environment. Things do go wrong but it's mostly about having the confidence and the know-how to enjoy the undersea world anticipating potential hazards and experiencing the excitement of being somewhere that most people won't ever see.